where you guys are with Christmas shopping, but um, we started off uh, really, really well uh, for the first day. And we got some things done, and then after a while we got distracted, and we had you know, Thanksgiving, we had, we had birthday, we had all sorts of different other things. And so lots of things began to compete with the Christmas shopping that needs to be done. This, of course, is a time that we think about, about gifts, but for our family it's a little bit more involved because not only do we have a Christmas shopping to plan for, we have Lily's birthday in November, and then we have Rachel's birthday in December. And so we have extra Christmas shopping, and we also have a big family in California who do a gift exchange, and so that kind of adds to that as well. Um, Lily was really excited for her birthday this year, as we were as well. Um, she has uh, one more year in single digits, and so she was, you know, likes to give us help and, and let us know what it is that she wants. And so she was alone with me. We were just watching TV one day, and as we were looking at a show, uh, she looks over at me and she goes, hey, um, if you're going to get me something, I'd like a Calico Critters a Panda Collection, accessories sold separately. <laughs> and then she pauses and she goes, I tell you that so that you're not confused. You know, don't want to be shocked. You know, when you go and buy one thing, you realize, well, I've got to buy more stuff. Here's the deal. <laughs> Appreciate her heart because, you know, her heart, you know, when it comes to, to gifts, is she understands that we want to give gifts to her because we love her. Um, our heart really tries to reflect God's heart. And so she asked for those things. And, of course, she, she got those things and, and then some. But she also asked for a bike. She wanted to have a bike, and, and she just wanted to have a you know, big girl bike to be able to enjoy with her friends, to be able to ride with her family. And, you know, those things aren't cheap. And so we told her, I don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to get that bike for you. And so she kept on, you know, thinking she's going to get a bike. And one day she was with my wife, and, and uh, um, we'd already gotten the bike the night before. And, you know, it's a big you know, bike, and we had to put the, the seats back to fit it in the car. And, and she goes off to school with my wife, and as she looks inside, she sees that she's going to have to move the seat back you know, to be able to sit down. And she goes, huh, why is the seat for you? Yeah. Yeah, she knows. Yeah, she's smart. And so Vicky responded real quickly because we happened to go to Costco that night too. And she said, oh, it's, it's not you know, anything like you were thinking. We just did big grocery shopping last night. She goes, oh. Yeah. Kind of disappointed. And she goes to school. And they come back a little bit later, and as soon as they come back, you know, they go into the house, and she runs in the house to check the refrigerator. Has a big smile on her face, and she goes, there's the same amount of groceries in the refrigerator as yesterday. <laughs> Why is she looking, right? Why is she expecting? She's expecting because she knows that she's loved. Listen, I don't know how you feel about, about gift giving. I know sometimes gift giving can can be a blessing to both the giver and, and the receiver, but sometimes it can also be stressful. Sometimes it can be something that's a little uh, overwhelming, that can be a little discouraging for, for both parties. Um, when it comes to, to gift giving, however you choose to give that gift, remember, gift giving in its purest form is reflecting the heart of God. See, the Bible says that every good gift comes from the Father. It comes from the Father of lights, with whom there's no shadow of turning, which means this. He's always good. All the time, no matter what's going on in your life, you have a God who's good and he's for you. And his heart is to bless his own. And so he wants to give gifts. And if we're going to reflect his heart, of course, we're going to give gifts as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 has something to say about that. Can you turn there with me, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's important to understand that as we give gifts, we begin to, to, to change. We receive God's blessings. And then, of course, we're moved to give. And as we are, we are becoming more and more like the God who has saved us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, notice what it says here in verse 10. Verse 10, it says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, that may be a lot to, to understand, but, but, but try to you know, change it into your own words. And what you discover is this. God has provided for you the things that will bless you, but he's also provided for you the things that will cause you and I to become a blessing to other people. Now it goes on. In verse 11 it says, While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, 
For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. The idea is this. You've been given all sorts of things in different categories to be able to bless other people in different ways. Not just one way, in multiple ways. Verse 13. While through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ for all your liberal sharing with them and all men. Verse 14. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Meaning this. God's grace in you his grace for you causes you to become this huge blessing to other people that other people notice. Verse 15, because of all this, because of the grace of God in your life for you and also through you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Meaning this, because you have received Jesus Christ, you have the blessings of God in full, in every way. But it's transformational. It transforms you to be who you were before to be a person who becomes a blessing to other people. So you used to live for yourself no longer. You used to just think about your own needs. Now you think about other people's needs. You used to be small in your thinking, only thinking about the things pertaining to right around you. But now you're thinking about the things that are pertaining to around everyone else. What is the thing that's going on in their life? What's the thing they're dealing with? What's their concern? What's their passion? What's even their desire? Now you want to be a blessing because you've been blessed so much by God. Simply put, because we've been forgiven, we want to forgive. Because we've been loved, we want to love. Because we are thankful, we become generous. And so we go Christmas shopping. Now, when it comes to, to the gifts that we shop for, each year there's something that is the gift to give. In 1929, the gift was the yo-yo. In 1936, it was Monopoly. 1943, it was this amazing thing called the Slinky. In 1959, it was the Barbie. In 1963, it was the Easy Bake Oven. In 1969, it was the Chemistry Set. In 1975, people have been enlightened. They've gotten you know, so smart. It was the Pet Rock which was purchased in a box with a handle with holes so, of course, the rock could breathe. And get this, inside was a 32-page manual about how to care for your pet rock. In 1980, it was the Rubik's Cube. In 1983, some of you remember this, it was the Cabbage Patch Kid. You guys remember that? This is the first time you saw the craze in Christmas shopping where people all of a sudden became satanically inspired when they went to give gifts <laughs> for their family. Cabbage Patch Kids, of course, sold out really quickly. You couldn't find any. My mother-in-law actually went to the store to pick one up for my wife, who at that time was 10 years old. And when she went there, she was told they didn't have any more. Okay. But then the salesman said this to her, kind of having compassion. I know of one. Come tomorrow morning and meet me at the back of the store before it opens, and I'll sell it to you. Okay. Somewhere there was a little child who was crying. Okay. I don't know how he got that. That was bad kid. Okay. Sounds kind of sketchy. 1992 was the Barbie Dream House. By the way, same year Barbie ran for president of the United States. 1995 was Beanie Babies. That was a big deal. 1996 was Tickle Me Elmo. You guys remember that one? That was a little bit more recent, and that was also crazy. In fact, that one was really big. People got violent. Two women got arrested for getting in a fist fight in Chicago over Tickle Me Elmo. Imagine that. Mom shows up on Christmas with a black guy, but I got it for you, sweetie. Okay. <laughs> 1997 was the Tamagotchi. You guys remember those ones? Those were a joy. You had to feed and clean your little virtual pet. That might have a psychological issue there. 1998 was the Furby. I don't know if you guys knew this, but... But some Furbies got bedazzled. One in particular is worth $100,000. Imagine a $100,000 Furby because it has diamonds all over it. 2006 was the PlayStation 3. That was a really, really big deal. And they were sold out. You know, they were selling out. One man was standing in line apparently at Walmart. And he was towards the back of the line. And there were quite a few people in front of him. And he heard from one of the associates that 
that there wasn't going to be enough to sell to everybody in the line. So he got creative, and he sent a family member to get coffee for every single person in the line ahead of him, and he laced it with a laxative. He got one. He got a PlayStation 3. <laughs> so creative. Uh, that's a gift that keeps on giving, right? So 2008, it was Elmo Live. Elmo just never dies. Elmo Live came out in 2008. Get this. This was kind of spooky. A little boy squeezed Elmo, and he's supposed to respond. Not only does he sing his song, but he also would talk to you. And this particular Elmo, I guess, was defective in some way. Somebody did something to him. So when he squeezed Elmo, Elmo said, kill James. But here's the spookier part of it. The little boy's name was James. Imagine that. Cured forever from Elmo. Yeah. 2010 was the iPad. Think about that. 2010 was the iPad. It wasn't that long ago, but it's changed a lot of people's lives. 2011 was Lex Rock Elmo. And 2013 was Big Hugs Elmo. I don't know what this year's you know, special gift is, but the important part to remember is this, that when it comes to the gifts that, that people give, if you give them with the right heart and you're wanting to bless the people that you love, you're reflecting the Lord's heart. There's nothing wrong with gift giving. The problem that we have so often when it comes to gift giving is we're focused on either receiving gifts or giving gifts to people, which is noble, rather than what do we give to God. Now, God is so good. He's the only one that is not offended that people give gifts on his birthday. <laughs> They're giving gifts to each other. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, I think that reflects the Lord's heart. But what do we give to him? As we're preparing for Christmas... I think that's an important thing for us to consider so we don't get caught up in all the things that Christmas tends to be about, but we're caught up in the things that it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about Jesus Christ. Remember, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. His indescribable gift is a gift that, that changes everything. Notice again Matthew 2, verse 11. Notice what they gave to Jesus. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. And they worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Notice, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, when it comes to these gifts, these gifts, of course, are, are beautiful gifts. The gift of myrrh is, is really speaking of the fact that Jesus is a sacrifice. Of course, Jesus died and he rose again. The gift of frankincense speaks of the fact that Jesus is a priest. Jesus forgives our sins and he cleanses us from our sins. The gift of gold is really speaking of the fact that Jesus is a king. And, of course, Jesus rules and he reigns. These gifts speak of what God did for us, but they also speak of what we should give to him. If you look at these gifts again, and you notice, again, gold. It's a gift for a king. It's speaking of treasures. Frankincense. That's a gift for a priest. And we are called to be priests to our God. We're to use our talents for the Lord. Myrrh speaks of sacrifice. I believe that's speaking of our time. We want to give our time to the Lord. So we give our treasures and our talents and our time to God. Turn your Bibles over to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. When it comes to this issue of what we would give to God or, or how we would communicate to God, how we interact with God, whether or not we live for God, we have a problem, and the problem is that in us is that desire for self. Also in us are the distractions that we have towards the things around us. And those things can quickly become idols. If you look at the context of Matthew 2, you notice that Herod himself is beset by idols. He's a man who worships himself. But there's lots of other things that people can worship, lots of other things that they can spend their treasures and their talents and their time on. We want to spend our treasures, our talents, and our time on God because that's where they belong. He deserves these gifts. These are the gifts that we ought to give to him. But it's not always that way. Notice Isaiah 46, verse 6. Speaking about idol worship, it says this, They lavish gold out of the bag and they weigh silver on the scales. Clearly speaking about treasures. It goes on to say, They hire a goldsmith, that is a person who has a specific talent, to be able to make things out of gold. And he makes it a god, small g, and they prostrate 
themselves. Yes, they worship, meaning they're committed, they're dedicated, and that, of course, takes their time. Meaning this, we can, of course, spend our treasures, our talents, and our time on anything we want. But if we spend those things on anything other than God, we have an idol in our life. And as we are approaching this Christmas season, I think it's important that we make sure that we are wise men who come and we dedicate the things that belong to God to God. Because everything we have, everything that, that we possess has been something that's a gift from God. And now it's time for us, of course, to give it back. So what should we give to God? First of all, we give him our treasure. We give our treasures to God. Turn over to Haggai chapter 2. We should give our treasure or our money to God. Haggai chapter 2. Now, at this, while you're turning there, let me point out, some will say, okay, a pastor at a church talking about money, okay, knew it was going to happen eventually. Some say, well, why should I give away my money? Let that question ring in your ears. Why should I give my money? It's not your money. Everything you have, everything you are, it belongs to God. Every single thing. He is Lord of all. Haggai chapter 2. Notice what it says. Haggai chapter 2. Notice verse 8. It says, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the context of what's being said here, he's correcting the people. He's saying, your lives aren't blessed. Your lives aren't the way they're supposed to be. You're struggling all the time, and you're wondering why. You know, you make money and you put it in a bag, but it's like you're putting it in a bag with holes. Your, your money, it, it's like it makes wings and it flies away. It's, it's there one moment and then it's gone. You work hard, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but you, but you never you have a satisfaction of your thirst. You're always hungry. You're never fulfilled. Why is it? And he, he explains the reason why. It's because you're focused on your own life. You're focused on your own house. In fact, it says you have paneled houses while well, this temple lies in ruins, meaning the house of God wasn't taken care of, but your whole house was decked out. Everything was perfect. You were spending your money on your things, but neglecting the things of God. God holds them to task for it. God withholds a blessing from them. God wants to bless, but he's not going to bless them while they're being disobedient. He's not going to bless them while they're being selfish. He's not going to bless them when they have wrong thinking because God desires people to be close to him. God desires for people to have the right thinking so that he can pour out blessings over their life. And so he's telling them, look, I'm not with you. Eventually they'll repent. And when they repent, God says this, from this day forward, I will bless you. Now think about that. If God says, I will bless you, you know he's going to bless you. And the one that gives to God, notice, God will be a debtor to no man. The person that gives to God, God will give back, and he'll give back more than that person could imagine. And so the silver, they're his. The gold, it's already his. But he's letting you keep 90%. He's saying, give back to me what is mine. Otherwise, you're robbing me. So it's not that God wants 10% of your money or that God needs 10% of your money. He doesn't need it. He's letting you be a steward of all of it, and he's letting you use 90% however you choose. But he's saying, trust me. Trust me with that tenth. That tenth is still a principle. Yes, it's from the Old Testament. But it's something that is never spoken against in the New. In fact, it's actually expanded upon. 10% is really a starting point. And that's the, the point that people wrestle with. Again, some people will say, well, it's an Old Testament law. No, the law is not not abolished by the new. And so these things are things that we still ought to teach. In fact, Jesus even said, woe unto those who tell other people not to keep the law. So we're not to, to tell people not to keep it. It's a law. And so it's still in effect. And with that law comes blessings. And when we fail to obey that law, comes consequences. Now the question is, what do I tithe? Do I tithe off the gross? Or do I tithe off the net? I think that's one of those questions that's kind of like, you know, how far is too far? You know? How much can I drink without, without really technically being drunk biblically? If you're asking these types of questions, like how much can I get away with and still be close to God? It, it kind of tells you your heart. 
And asking the question, you know, what do I tie? Do I tie it off the gross or the net? It, it seems like you know, you're trying to hold on to something. And you need to be led by the Lord. God needs to speak to you, of course. But you need to check your heart if you're asking that type of question. Some people say, well, what do I do if I, if I don't have enough to give? Well, I don't know. That's something you need to take before the Lord. You know, well, I don't want to tithe. If I, if I tithe and I can't make ends meet, you know, then, then what happens after I tithe? Then, then I'm going to be you know, having to go back to the church you know, and ask for money. If, if people aren't tithing, the church isn't going to have money to give. You know? So how exactly does that work? People get themselves all stressed out. People start to worry. People start to struggle. They start to doubt. You see, tithing, giving of our money, it's a trust issue. And that trust will push out the doubt. The trust pushes out the fear. The trust ultimately leads to a blessing. Remember this. Financial giving isn't primarily about generosity to God. Financial giving is about trusting God. What you're doing when you give is you're trusting that when you give to God, God will take care of the rest so that you will have to think about nothing. Listen to the story. It's an old story I heard a long time ago. A man is wandering through a desert. He conserves his water carefully until it's all gone and he knows he's in trouble. That thirst gets deeper and deeper until he sees an old deep well hand pump. So he runs to it. He lifts the handle and pulls it down, but all he hears is the sound of metal on metal. His heart sinks. He starts to panic. Then he sees a plaque under the pump. And on it is inscribed a message. Dear stranger, do not despair. This well has never run dry. Just follow these instructions. Here are the instructions. Under the pump in front of you, buried under the sand, is a bottle of water. Pick up the bottle of water, pour it into the cylinder, and start priming the pump. After priming the pump, water will come out. You can drink all the water you want. You can take all the water you want. But do not forget to fill up the bottle again and leave it buried in the sand for the next person that comes by. Warning. You're going to be tempted to drink the bottle of water. Don't do it. Empty it out as instructed and you will have all the water you need and so will the person that comes after you. That's a, I don't know if that's a true story or not. It's a fantastic parable. The truth of the matter is this, tithing is that way. What you're doing is priming the pump. You're giving of what you have, and you're saying, God, it belongs to you, but I give it in faith even though I don't have that much, believing that not only is God going to bless you through it, but listen, he's going to prepare you through the giving to be a blessing to other people. Prime the pump. You're priming the pump, and what you're doing is you're complimenting the character of God. You're saying, God, this is how good I believe you are. Here you go. This is how powerful I believe you are. Here you go. This is how much I trust your will. Here you go. And know what happens is this. Your giving is worship. Your giving is genuine faith to God. Listen, God does not need your money. God wants everything in your life. He wants all of you. Because when you give your money, what you're doing is you're saying, God, all of you, every part, every part of me, I trust you. I trust in you. And now you're saying you have control. There's no better way to give control to someone than to give them all your money. <laughs> you have control. Now, sit back and watch what God does with your finances. I guarantee you, he's better at finances than anyone in this room is. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can sell them at any time and give you all the money. Right? God will be a debtor to no man. When you give, you will, in fact, receive. You see, Malachi chapter 3 says this. Let me read it to you. Will a man rob God? And the answer is, of course not. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? God responds, in tithes and offerings. It goes on in verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouses that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Meaning, test me now in this. Only time in scripture where God ever says to anyone, test me. Test me now in this. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing 
but there will not be enough room to contain it. It is the only time in the scripture that you ever see God say, test me. It has to do with finances. Test me now in this. You give, and I guarantee you, God will bless you. God will bless you, and he will fulfill you. He will satisfy you. All your needs will be met, but he will also give you way more than you could ever give because he is a good God. And the person who experienced this is that you know this, if you've experienced this truth, this principle, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You then can become what the Bible describes as a cheerful giver. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 uh, says that if we give, we should give as we intend to. We shouldn't give out of compulsion. We're not forced to. We give because we've intended to, and we give um, liberally. But then it goes on to say in verse 7 that God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful is kind of unfortunate. I wish there was an English Bible that actually translated what it means literally. What it means is a hilarious giver. God loves a hilarious giver, meaning this. When you give to God, he gives back to you more than you thought that you ever could receive. When you give to God, though, he does something in you. Think about this. When you give that gift to your child, when we gave those gifts to our daughter, we were excited to see how excited she was. We're blessed to see how blessed she is. When you give, it does feel good. We know that. But when you give to God, it's better. And he fills you to overflow. And now all of a sudden what happens is the person is so filled with joy, it's like <laughs> hilariously giving. We give with, with so much joy. It's like, why is that person so happy? God's good. Well, what do you mean? Well, I, I just got to do this. I just got to give away that. And you're excited about it. Because you know this, that when you give, God always gives more, and he gives more in multiple ways. And so what should we give to God? We give him our treasure. Secondly, we give him our talents. We give him our talents. We dedicate our abilities. We dedicate our gifting. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is an interesting passage, and the context is talking about how we're ministering, how we're serving, how we're using our gifts for the kingdom, but it also is dealing with a problem that existed back in that the time of the church of Corinth. The people at that time, they were very immature. Many of them were focused on, on I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. I mean, there was divisions or factions within the church, but also they were boastful about their gifts. They were boastful about the things that God had given them, and so they were thinking, well, I'm a teacher, you know, and they're telling everybody they're a teacher as they're waiting in line to get a coffee. You know, I'm this, I'm, I'm a really gifted worship leader. They kind of dropped that. You know, people catch on to that when people do this, but it happens in churches all the time, especially with those who aren't presently being used. They want everybody to know that they have all these different gifts and talents. Those who are critical, they want everybody to know that they could do it better than the people who are doing it. But yet, strangely, these people actually don't serve. They don't give their gift, but they like talking about their gift. You see, the problem is for a lot of people, they confuse their gift with their calling. They have a gift. They might really have a gift, but God is saying, you know what? Be faithful with this first. And then the doors will open. You'll be able to use that gift in its right time. But when someone is gifted, especially in something up front like worship or teaching or leadership, the tendency of that person is not to just sit and let the ministry come to them. The tendency is to take it. Listen, if you've been given a gift and God hasn't opened the doors for you to use that gift yet, serve where the doors are open. Serve. Jesus said, if you're faithful with the first things, more is going to be given to you. He said, what if I'm not seen? What, you know, there's too many people around, and maybe I won't get that opportunity. Wait a second. Do you need to be seen by men or by God? If you're seen by God, he will move people's hearts in a position of authority to ask you. It'll come to you. So be faithful. So start off with the first things. We need people to clean the church. We need people to volunteer in the nursery and the children's ministry. We need people to be greeters. We need people who want to work in the building. Do those things. You're like, well, I have the ability to, to do things with my hands. You know, I'm good you know, with electricity. I'm, I'm good, you know, as a framer. I'm, I'm, I'm good with, with plumbing stuff. You know, but I don't know if that's a spiritual gift. Yes, it is. It's a spiritual gift. Bezalel and Aholiab, they were people who were gifted, the Bible says, by the Holy Spirit in all manner of workmanship. I mean, they were supernaturally gifted to work with their hands. And some people, you know, are gifted that way. Maybe that's you. Use that gift for the Lord. You say, but I really want to be a teacher. Well, let's see if the Lord does that. Be a good carpenter first. Be one who knows how to clean the toilets really well. So then when you, when you become a pastor, you can deal with people's sins. Right? Trust me, it will remind you of it again and again. Right? 
Be faithful with the first things. And then, of course, more is going to be given to you. But be faithful with those first things. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, speaking about this issue, says this, And what do you have that you did not receive? Notice those words again. What do you have that you did not receive? What do you have? Any gift you have, any spiritual gift, any ability, any talent you have, it was something that was given to you. So where's the boasting? There's no boasting. What this means practically is this. If you happen to have a really good voice and you're singing on the worship team and you walk off the stage and somebody just walks up and says, wow, that was amazing. You have such a wonderful voice. People who have a hard time with that, you know, what do you say? You know, yeah, I know I do. You know, my mom and everybody else tells me I'm going to go on American Idol next year. You know, no, that's kind of weird. What do you say? You know, oh, no, no, I don't. You know, I, you know, I go off key sometimes and I really struggle with certain songs. Don't do that. Here's what you do. If somebody comes up to you and tells you, hey, you know what, you have a fantastic voice, or they come up to you and you're, let's say you're a teacher, hey, I love your messages. Or, or maybe they come up to you and they say, look, you are such an amazing servant. Or, or, or let's say it's now holiday time. Somebody says, hey, you know what, that was a wonderful meal. You are an amazing cook. You're an amazing baker, whatever it might be. Here's what you say. Thanks. Watch this. Thanks. It's not even prideful. Watch. Thanks. If it comes from the heart of a person who knows this, you are complimenting me on something okay, I was given. I was given it. It was a gift from God. Don't demean the gift of God. Don't take credit for the gift of God. Just simply say, thanks. Thank you. Now, if that's out of the way, now, next step, use it. Use the gift. If God's given you a gift, then use the gift. Whatever that gift might be, there's tons of gifts. There's a New Testament, you have 25. 25 spiritual gifts. Use that gift and use that gift to glorify and honor the God who gave you that gift because that gift wasn't given for you personally. The gift was given so that you would be a blessing to other people. Romans 12, verse 6. Let me read it to you. Romans 12, verse 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Meaning this, we all have different gifts. Some of us might have similar gifts. Some of us might even have the same gift. But none of us have all the same gifts. We have gifts and they are different from one another. They complement one another. Use those gifts. Not every one of us is, a, is an eye, the scripture would say. Not every one of us is a mouth, being able to speak. Not every one of us is a foot. Not every one of us is a hand. Every one of us is different and we complement one another as members of the body of Jesus Christ. So use your gift to glorify God. Are you using your gift? Here's something you can, you can give to the Lord. Give him a commitment that this coming year is going to be different than the years before. You're going to get involved. You're going to get to know people. You're going to serve. You're going to give him your talents. Those talents are not yours. Now, I realize this. Some people wrestle with what's the difference between a talent and an ability and a gift there's a lot of talk between, well, you know, if this happened at this time, if it happened when you first got saved, but let's say before you didn't speak at all, and now after you got saved, you become a teacher. Well, that's clearly a gift. But if you could speak before you got saved, and then you got saved, well, that's clearly an ability. It's not a gift. I think people think too much. Can you do it? Yes. Are you good at it? Yes. It's a gift. Amen. Because without God, you can do nothing. With him, you can do anything. Now, of course, sometimes those gifts are magnified in the sense that after you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you're able to do things or you tend to do things you never thought of doing before. Sure, that's wonderful. But if you can do it, if you're good at it, if blessing comes when you do it, it's a gift. Now, having said that, some teachers, really good teachers, and we have wonderful teachers in the church, I totally understand that when somebody is a teacher, and they're using that ability, you know, 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours a week. The last thing they want to do on a Sunday is be with kids. I get that. I totally get that. You need a break. I totally understand that. Recognize this. 
that when you are at school, teachers, you are using that gift for God. If you are honoring the Lord while you teach. Amen? Listen. If you work in construction and you're working with your hands every single day, every, every time that you build something and you build it well, every time you do your job without complaint, you're honoring the Lord. You're doing that before the Lord. That's worship to Him. You're giving that gift to God. Amen? Whatever your job might be, you do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord because you know you serve the Lord and not man. But there's something, something that you can do at church. Do it. For some people, it's amazing. You know, in our ascending church, we had some people who, who made a lot of money. You know, the type of people that are presidents or CEOs of companies. When they came to church, they wanted to be greeters. Because they just enjoyed being with people. They didn't have to leave. They didn't have to be the guy. And they didn't have to be the woman. They just got to be a person that loves Jesus. So whatever the thing is that you do, whatever you're good at, do it unto the Lord. Serve him in it, away from the church. But in the church, do something. Do something, because if every one of us does our part, if every one, as the scripture says, does his share, it provides blessing or edification for the body as a whole. Otherwise, what happens is a handful of people do all the work. That's not right. That's not fair. Listen, that's not loving. We need to serve. We need to connect. We need to plug in. We need to give. So we want to give of our talents. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12 says, Even so, you... Since you are zealous, longing, you have a great desire for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Don't miss this. What do you give to God? Give him your talents. I Meaning ask God for more talents, but don't ask God for more talents so you have a big, you know, flash, big excitement, you know, this great dynamic, lots of sound, lots of enthusiasm, and no movement. Ask for the Lord to bless you with gifts. Be zealous for those gifts so you can use them for the edification of the church. That's why they're there. Those gifts are given to you. Those blessings are given to you so that you can be a blessing to other people. Sadly, in many churches, the gifts are the focus for the gift's sake. We want more gifts so that we can know that God's here. No. We want more gifts so we can glorify God by how we treat people. We need the gifts because we're not enough by ourselves. When we give something in our flesh, we're going to hurt people. But when we give something empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will help people. That's what we need to be as a church. We need to be a church that helps people. And that only happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need our talents to be given to God. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Turn there with me, please. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. You see, your talents were given to you to bless other people. Your talents were given to you to honor a holy and living God. 1 Peter 4, verse 10 tells us this. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As you've received a gift, use it to bless one another. But it goes on as good stewards of the manifold or multi-layered grace of God. Again, your talents were given to you to bless other people, but your talents were also given to you to honor God. Now, some people will say, even at this point, look, I hear you. You know, I got some money, so I'll give my treasures. I'll finance other people's gifts. <laughs> you have spiritual gifts. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have gifts. Some will say, I'm not gifted. I'm just not. I don't have any gifts whatsoever. You say, well, spend time with me. Ask me. Talk to me. Ask people around me. They'll all tell you the same thing. He is not gifted. Is that possible? Is that possible that there is a believer in Jesus Christ that is not gifted? I don't believe that. We get saved, and we all experience the same salvation. We all experience the same God, and he's a good God and knows how to give good gifts to his children. And let's just say, for argument's sake, you have one gift. Excel in that one gift. Here's the reality. 
I guarantee you, you don't just have one gift. You have multiple gifts. The key is, the only way for us to understand those gifts is that we spend time in the Word. We spend time in prayer. We spend time in fellowship with other believers. In other words, we have to first go deep. We have to first connect and be with the body for us to be able to have the opportunity to both discern what our gift is and then also to use that gift. We need to be with each other. Sometimes, frankly, just being with each other is a gift. It's called the gift of hospitality. That we have a heart for people, that we have a love for people. That's a gift. There are many, many gifts. We don't have time to talk about all the gifts in the Scripture, but you'll find them all throughout the Scripture. In the New Testament specifically, you'll find them in Romans chapter 12. You'll find them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. You'll find them in, in um, the book of Ephesians chapter 4. But you'll also see other gifts that I believe are spiritual gifts, not just in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament, like Bezalel and Aholiah who are gifted with their hands, and they make things, and they worship for God. There are many, many gifts that we can have. Whatever that gift is, use it. Use it in the life that you have, in the time that you have here on earth to glorify God. In Acts 20, verse 24, Paul is speaking to the Ephesians elders, and as he's speaking to them, he's talking about his life and his difficulty, but then also he's talking about his ministry to them as he is now leaving them, having prepared them for what's to come. They're going to be dealing with difficult things. And so he challenges them, he warns them, but then he says these words here in Acts 20, verse 24, after speaking about the difficult things that have gone on in his life. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He's describing a life well lived. He has given of his treasure. He's given of his talents. And as he's given of his talents, he's saying, look, one day when I die, I know I'm going to finish my race with joy. Because he knows all too well what Isaiah 65 verse 14 says. That is, the servant of the Lord shall be filled with joy. When you give, you become a hilarious giver. You're filled with joy. When you serve, when you give of your talents, you become joyful. Because as you're giving to the Lord the things that he's given to you, your ability to serve, your ability to help, your ability to teach, your ability to lead worship, whatever the thing might be, as you're serving God's people at church, you're ultimately filled with joy. You're blessed. And here's why. Because you found your purpose. You understand there's a place for you. You have a purpose. You don't just come to church to receive. You don't just come to church to sit. You come to church to grow and to magnify God by the way you treat other people. And so give of your treasure. Give of your talents. But also give of your time. That's the third thing that we should give to God. We need to give our time. Psalm 31, verse 15 says this. Listen to these words. My times are in your hand. The idea is this. My life, your life, it's in God's hand. He holds our life. We don't know how much time we have. Whatever amount of time we have, though, is God's. It belongs to him. And he can take it at any time. And that time, of course, it goes by really fast. I mean, some of you know that all too well. Some of you are learning that right now in this season. For me, I'm learning that in this season more than ever. I'm 47 years old, and it just seems like yesterday I was not. It seems like yesterday I was, was 30. I was in the early 30s when I came up here to start this church. When I first went into ministry, I was in my early 20s. And you know, when my wife and I got married, we were in our early 20s and we had kids. And, and they grow up quick. And things change quick. And we've noticed we change quick. You know, lots of different ways that happens. But I've noticed one thing that changes is my thinking. I have a lot of information. I have a really good memory. It's in my head, but sometimes the recall on some of those things get kind of mixed up. Do you notice that when you get older? It's not that, I'm convinced, it's not that you're losing intelligence, it's just that you have so much in there. Right? <laughs> it's not exactly, like, categorized correctly. So, so like, 
you know a thing, but you can't say the thing you know. And it's just, <laughs> it just doesn't come out. I've noticed that happens even with names. I can remember hundreds and hundreds of names. I have a great memory with names. But I have forgotten the names of my kids. I have actually more than once referred to different daughters as homie. And that's not just saying, like, what's up, homie? Homie, my dog's name. Like, uh, 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 uh. Or I've cycled through the names. I'm calling someone, uh, Rachel, Sarah, Abby, Caleb, Lily. You know, have to go through all the names. As you get older, things change. Your perspective changes, too, when it comes to what's really important to you. Again, Psalm 31, verse 15 says, my times are in his hand. And what happens is, as we rest in his hands, something kind of happens. He kind of wears off on us in a wonderful way. And we begin to develop a heart that's a little more prioritized. We begin to develop a heart that is thinking more of eternal things. We begin to develop a heart that is deeper. Now, on this one, it's frankly my favorite thing in terms of all the things that we could give to God. Yes, we are commanded in Scripture to give God our treasure. Yes, it is profitable to the body as a whole, to give of our talents. And we need that in this church. But it is wonderful to be able to give God our time. Listen, as a, a dad and, and soon to be grandfather, which is weird to me that our baby is having a baby. That just blows me away. Early part of this coming year, you know, we will have a little baby in our family named Colette. Her name will be Coco for the family. I can't wait. I am so excited. This is really good because my wife will tell you, I've been wanting to have a baby for a very long time. So I've been trying to convince her it is good for us to have more kids. She didn't want to have more kids. I go, but we need to have more kids. I want a baby. I want to have a baby. And then Sarah got pregnant. I thought, yes. See? I get what I want, a baby in our family. She gets what she wants, not to be pregnant. Right? What a blessing. Right? Isn't it crazy to think how quickly those days come? Where you go from being a brand new dad or a brand new mom to now you're becoming a grandfather or a grandmother? It goes fast. And here's what happens as you get older. I think it's true for everybody. I know it's true for me and it's true for my wife. We just want to be together. We just want to be with each other. We want to enjoy the time that we have with each other as a couple and with our family as a whole. We want to be together. And that's what God wants. You know, when we gather together for, for family night, which is Sunday night in our family, I get this oftentimes, well, what are we going to do? Honestly, I really don't care. We're going to eat. We know that's going to happen. I, I want to spend time in the Word and just have a brief devotion of the family. But honestly, after that, we could literally sit in a circle and stare at each other, and I would love it. It doesn't matter to me what we do. I just want to be with them. And I'm glad they want to be with us. And I never want that to change. Listen, if that's my heart and I'm a sinner, if that's your heart and you're a sinner, well, how much more when it comes to God? You see, God's heart is to be with his people. In Song of Solomon, chapter 5, there's an interesting story. Let me read it to you. The Shulamite, the woman, is speaking, and she says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew and my locks with the drops of the night, meaning my hair is wet. It's cold and wet out here. Verse 3, she responds, I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? Verse 4 says, my beloved put his hand on the latch of the door. So he puts his hand on the latch of the door, and he's kind of beginning to open it, but he doesn't actually open it. He just puts his hand there, and she says this, and my heart yearned for him. Verse 5, I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. What's it saying? Here's what it's saying. God longs for you. Jesus has this deep desire for you, and all he wants is to be with you. Listen. He's not looking for you to do some big, amazing thing. He's not looking for you to empty your whole bank account and drop it off at the church. No, you can't. 
He's not looking for that, okay? What he's looking for you to do is be with him. That's what he wants more than anything else, just to be with him. And notice, he knocks at the door. He doesn't burst through. He knocks at the door, and he's saying, come away with me. That's what he's saying. Come away with me. Just be with me. Spend some time with me. She hears, and she says, I long for him. She admits it. I long for him. I want to be with him. But much like Paul in the book of Romans, the thing I will to do, I do not do. The thing I will not to do, I practice. In other words, I roll over, and I go back to sleep. And so he knocks again. She won't come. He might knock again and again and again, and she does not get up because for her, she wants that thing, sleep and rest, self-satisfaction more than anything else. For you, it might be something else. For whatever reason, we delay and we don't go. What does he do? He keeps coming, and he puts his hand on the door. And the idea is he puts his hand on the door, and sometimes you know what that's like when someone's on the other side, maybe your kids coming into your room, their hand's on the door, you can see it kind of moving. They know they're supposed to knock, they knock, and they're waiting for you to answer, and then you and your spouse are like, pretend we're knocking. Maybe they'll go away. Right? That's what she's doing. His hand's on the door. She might see the lock begin to turn, the handle move. She doesn't come. She delays, and finally she gets up. And when she gets up, listen, she goes to open the door, and her hand drips with myrrh. The idea is this. He is saturated in it. What? His love and sacrifice for you and me. He's saturated in myrrh. Myrrh is embalming fluid. It's speaking about his death. He's saturated in it. Thinking about you and me all the time, longing to hear our voice. In fact, in Song of Solomon, he yells it. Let me hear it. I want to hear your voice. Meaning this, if he was able to tell you right now, audibly, what he wants more than anything else, I guarantee you it's not your treasure. I even guarantee you it's not your talent. It is your time. If you give him your time, everything else will fall right into place. He longs for you. But finally, when we get up and we go to that door, he's gone. It's speaking of missed opportunities, meaning this. Each person here, I guarantee you, has missed opportunities from this past week. For some of you, it was the opportunity of waking up this morning and spending time with God. There was a blessing called the blessing of this morning. It was for you, from God, and you missed it. Listen, you'll never get that blessing again. You won't. Maybe it was last night when God said, shut the TV off. Turn the game off. Get off the computer. Put down the phone. Spend time with me. Just spend time with me. And you didn't. Or maybe you said, okay, in a moment, Lord. And you never got back to it. That blessing of last night, it was yours. It's gone. You'll never get it back. But don't be discouraged. There's always another blessing with God. There's always another blessing that's coming. You have a blessing this afternoon. You have a blessing tonight. You have a blessing tomorrow morning. You have a blessing for Tuesday. You have a blessing for Wednesday. You have a blessing for Thursday. You have a blessing for Friday. You have a blessing for Saturday. You have a blessing for next week. You have a blessing for every single day of your life. And you have multiple blessings all throughout the day. And you can have as many of them as you choose if you simply spend time with him. Because when you spend time with God, you're in a place of blessing. He will, in fact, bless you, and he'll bless you to overflow. Something important to remember about God is this. He'll be a debtor to no man. When you give, you are blessed. That's why Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. As you give to God, he will bless you back. And he'll bless you back in greater ways than you and I could possibly imagine. Let me finish with this. J. Vernon McGee loved to talk about the man Enoch. Because Enoch isn't mentioned many times in the Bible. We don't know a whole lot about him. He gets a little short verse in the book of Genesis chapter 6. It says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's it. And that's really all we know about the man. But J. Vernon explained it in the way a, an old country preacher could only explain it. He said this. I like to think of the story this way. Enoch was outside of his house, and one day God walked by, and he said, Enoch, let's go for a walk. And so he said, yes, Lord. And they walked, and they talked, and they spent time with one another. And then God walked him back to his house. The next day, 
he went over to Enoch's house and he said, Enoch, let's go for a walk. And he said, yes, Lord. And they went for a walk. And they walked and they talked. And they walked and they talked. And this would happen every single day. God would come by Enoch's house and say, let's go for a walk. Enoch would go for a walk. And they would walk and they talk and they walk and they talk. And they just had a great time. One day, God went by Enoch's house and he said, Enoch, let's go for a walk. And Enoch and God walked and talked and they walked and they talked and they walked and they talked so much they lost track of time. And they'd walked so far that God said to Enoch, you know what? We're closer to my house than to yours. Let's go there. And he said, yes. Listen, what does God long for? What does he want? What do we give him? We give him our treasure, our talents, and our time. Listen, wise men still give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Would you stand with me?